welcome to this third presentation of the St. Louis Chamber Chorus 2020-2021 speaker series. My name is Andy Jensen, assistant conductor, and as always, I'm joined by Philip Barnes, here to uh, spend a little bit of time this afternoon listening to this wonderful songs of the Christmas season uh, written specifically for the Chamber Chorus. That first piece was Good Day Sir Christmas by frequent collaborator Francis Pott. Yes, a uh, good friend from England. Francis is really um, such a gifted composer. He uh, is a, a pianist, but also um, from a very early age, a singer. So he brings a singer's sensibilities to the way he writes for the voice. That's not to say, as I'm sure you will uh, recognize, that it's easy, but it is possible. And um, a really inspired composer, everything that he writes has a hallmark of uh, quality and inspiration. And we've been so lucky to, to perform his music. And that wonderful piece was uh, commissioned as a, a present um, for our own Dan Hansen um, on our board, who's responsible for the wonderful images of this season, putting, collating this and curating this series. And uh, as he himself, I think, has said, there can't surely be a better Christmas present than something like that. You had no idea it was coming, and then you get to hear this work of original art written for you. So <clears throat> let's move on now to another piece. Um, this is a work um, that was written also, or commissioned also by some dear friends in the choir, Dave Bowers and his wife, the late Kathy Smith Bowers. Um, we haven't performed this piece since it was premiered, and that is no comment on its quality. It's a fantastic piece. We will, I'm sure, perform it again sometime because it is so atmospheric and beautiful. But it's a little difficult sometimes to get these pieces to sort of fit together in a coherent way, and that's really the only reason why you haven't probably heard this piece in a very long time. It's a setting of words by Hildegard of Bingen, 12th century mystic uh, nun who was a musician and a poet herself. O viridissima virgo. The whole thing has the uh, metaphor of um, nature. And so this is O most verdant, O most green, fertile maiden, obviously referring to Mary. The music's by Ivan Moody, who um, I had the pleasure of working with and meeting. He uh, started off in England, like me, but um, his airline ticket didn't say the USA, it said Portugal. And so he lives with his family in Portugal um, and has made his sort of professional life there. But he's also not just a musician, but he's an orthodox priest. And so he brings to his compositions a sort of sense of the sublime and, and, uh, and the divine, indeed. And so uh, we'll hear now this, this wonderful piece by Ivan that obviously takes its inspiration for, from that sort of tradition of orthodox chant. So, O Viridissima Virgo by Ivan Moody.
O Viridissima Virgo by Ivan Moody. You can clearly, I think, hear the influence of chant in that work. And it has a sort of timeless, otherworldly nature to it. Yeah, and um, it's not a piece that I've performed. Uh, and I'm going to have words with you later about that. It's such a fantastic piece of music. Uh, in a decade I've been in this choir. That's really, really striking. I was really, um, I was really taken by how effectively he used some very, very old techniques along with these ancient words to sort of seduce you into to feeling as if you're listening to something that's historically authentic and then creating a, 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 this great atmosphere using modern harmony, you know, mm -hmm. in, in ways that were truly interesting. That was a really, really it's fine quite piece, a piece of music. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, and, and I've always fascinated with, with pieces that seek to, to kind of reconcile the, the ancient and the modern, you know, especially when you have an old text in a new setting or combined with an old melody, perhaps, that finds a new home. And in our next piece by Martha Schaefer, we see a similar kind of thing. We do. Uh, this was a, a remarkable compilation, I suppose, might be a word for it, that I asked Martha to put together. Martha, of course, was our longtime wonderful um, rehearsal accompanist, but rehearsal accompanist is a bit like calling somebody, Werner von Braun, like a rocket scientist. I mean, she was so much more than just a rehearsal accompanist. And um, her insights into what would work for this particular choir, how the voices could come together, not only helped us in our weekly preparation of the concerts, but of course also it informed her own composition. And so we're going to hear now, as you say, a piece that com combines very early music with very modern music. And so what I asked her to do was to try to set um, a very ancient poem by a fifth century poet, Caelius Sedulius, which uh, is a wonderful name for this type of poem. I never knew what it was until I was researching it. It's called an abecedary. And because of that, uh, the reason is, the first verse begins with A, the second verse begins with B, and C, and get where we're going, A, B, C, D, E. So when we get to H, we have this chant that's associated with Caelius Sedulius, and then we have a version, uh, an elaboration of the chant by the um, early, very, very, very early Renaissance composer, Guillaume Dufay. Um, and so we have his three-part setting, and then we have Martha giving different treatments as all these verses sort of come along, one in one after the other. In right, and it works in sort of a, a alternating fashion. Yeah. So you, you hear it uh, come and go. And and those of you that, that know Martha, you know, in my experience with her, with the choir, she's a very quiet person, sort of unassuming. But the way that this piece ends shows just how, how mighty her spirit must be inside, because it, it is a really tremendous closing. So this is Hostias Herodes by Martha Schaefer.
the final chords of that piece sound to me very much, they remind me very much of French organ music. Of course, Martha is herself an organist, so I wonder if it's like a, a little nod to Guillaume Dufay uh, <laughs> there at the end. A wonderful piece. We'll, we'll stay with uh, the idea of these, these um, European influences, and now for a, a piece by another former member of the choir. This is Charles Collins, who for some years sang bass with us and wrote several pieces for us. We recorded his uh, Mass of St. Louis on one of our earlier discs, which is a really wonderful piece. We should do it again. But this next piece, with the unlikely sounding title of Yulupu on Rakanetu, um, is a piece that I think comes from his years uh, living in Finland. He uh, speaks Finnish, and um, this piece um, became sort of an earworm for me. I just couldn't get it out of my head. So we have performed it um, on different occasions, but this um, recording we're going to hear actually is, I think I'm right in saying, the first time we ever made the jump from cassettes to CDs. Mm. And so this was a private recording which we made in South St. Louis at St. Mark's Episcopal Church, one very cold winter's night, which seems appropriate. Yes. So, Yulupu on Rakanetu by Charles Collins. What a lovely piece. 
This first half of the program really includes a lot the, uh, of pieces that I've never sung before. Um, and so there's a very different experience, you know, I'm almost more like an audience member than a singer. Uh, the next piece, however, uh, is one that I was a part of. Uh, its premiere, Du Medium Silencium by Wolfram Buchenberg. Uh, I recall uh, our early, early moments of rehearsing this piece and what struck me right away um, was how interesting, uh, the interesting way in which he utilizes the lower voices. This piece grows from, from the depths out into the world and uh, it really struck me that so many, um, so many composers, the modern composers that we commission or, or other pieces that we perform, you know, when they're interested in creating strange or um, uh, colorful harmonic language, they often allow the basses and baritones to establish a, 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 some kind of traditional triad harmony. And then somewhere in the tenors and altos give us those nice colorful notes as I sometimes call it. Um, but in this case, and also I notice often, and we'll hear it later in Judith Bingham, there is a much more adventurous way of using the lowest register voices, uh, which I think is, is somewhat challenging to pull off. You have to have really confident and capable singers, which perhaps that's, that's something that these composers know that, that we have and, and are able to, to venture into that territory. But I'll let Philip tell you a little bit more about the specifics on this one. Well, this is a, one of those pieces of our repertoire written for two choirs in some ways. So um, it's a very big chamber chorus. And so uh, we make a, a virtue out of that by saying to composers, please think of this as a, a sort of choral conversation. Uh, conceive your music as a conversation between two choirs. You can either do it by having a choir of upper voices speaking to lower voices, or you can have two equally balanced choirs talking to one another. And you'll certainly hear that. And much of the remaining uh, pieces we're going to hear today are in fact constructed like that. So this piece by Wolfram um, certainly makes most use of the eight voices, a very rich sound. And uh, I've never met Wolfram Buchenberg. I don't know that he's ever been here. Um, he is a remarkably original, it's funny, remarkably original but in a traditional vein, church composer in southern Germany. And uh, his music always comes, I think, from a position of deep faith and also from a particular um, resonance for, for lyrics. So this, this piece may not necessarily remind you of Christmas to begin with, but the words are indeed appropriate for this as a sort of prophecy of the fact that in the middle of the silence of the night of Christmas Eve, the Christ child will be delivered to earth, will come to earth. So uh, Wolfram Buchenberg, Dum Medium, Silencio.
through medium silencium, one of my favorite pieces we've, we've done in, in the last several years. Um, just want to take a moment to, to share so many of you, you know, faithfully attend our concerts and, and have heard the choir sing, you know, over many years. So you may have had the pleasure or consider it the pain of having sat in the very front row to feel the full force of the choir's uh, vocal strength. I always uh, enjoy those moments in a piece like that where we have absolute serenity at the beginning and the end, but there is a moment where you are invited and allowed uh, in, in, in some ways to, uh, to, to use your full self, to use your full voice. And to do that in an in a unrestrained way, it's like a slugger swinging for the fences. Sometimes you hit a home run, sometimes you strike out and fall down. But I always enjoy that about this choir, that we do take those risks, that we do go, go for those moments. And, and when it happens just right, it's, it's spectacular and memorable. It is, I agree. It's also, by the way, one of the uh, reasons why choral music is not beloved of radio stations. Uh, quite seriously, it's an incredible challenge for the engineers. Um, as you heard in that piece, it starts incredibly quietly and it ends incredibly quietly. And so if the engineers just leave the recording the way it comes to them, they start to get telephone calls or now emails and texts saying, you seem to have gone offline or we can't hear anything. And then, of course, the engineer goes, oh, I better put up the volume. And so then you get those loud bits and then you get emails from people saying, you have just blown my speakers. <laughs> and so you, it's, it's one of those things you can't win. Um, I have a radio program that some of you have been able to hear every so often, a weekly program on the classical radio station in St. Louis in, on a Wednesday evening. And uh, my producer, Brandon Lemieux, who's fantastic at this, you know, he spends ages getting that one hour of music all balanced out. Much more work than some of the other shows that he puts together. It, it is a bit of a nightmare. So although it's great that we have this opportunity in these strange times to take a look back on what we've done and what we've achieved and everything. And it's wonderful to welcome so many of you here to Third Baptist to be here in person. There is nothing that can substitute for sitting on that front row, as you say, <laughs> in a live performance. And that, of course, is what we're all looking forward to so much, to the day when the choir can reform, come back together and perform uh, for you, the audience, and of course, for one another. Yeah. So. We move on to uh, another one of our uh, former composers in residence, Yakov Gubanov. And uh, this setting uh, is one that I, I have not performed, but um, when I saw the title, I thought, oh, this will be a, a, an arrangement of the familiar uh, tune by Pretorius, but uh, I was wrong. So I'll let Philip tell you a little bit more about what you're actually going to hear. Well, we had pleasure just of listening to a piece in Latin by a German and so now we have a piece in German written by a I suppose Ukrainian Russian who lives now in Italy. Um, for several years Yakov was our composer in residence and is still a good friend and um, he is really such a gifted composer, such a brilliant mind. Um, he's a really top-notch expert, for example, on Tchaikovsky. And I've had the great honor to attend some Tchaikovsky performance with him in Moscow. And, and it's, it's a really wonderful privilege to hear Tchaikovsky's performed by Russians uh, with a sort of Russian interlocutor. So you can, you can get a feeling of the genius of that composer. And Yakov also uh, has a remarkable pedigree um, in his late teens, I think it was, he was the last student of Dmitry Shostakovich. So he is steeped in Russian music. But at the fall of the Soviet Union, shortly after, he found himself as a, a sort of visiting scholar in Frankfurt in Germany. And indeed is, speaks German and, and loves German culture and German music. So when we had a concert called A German Christmas, I thought it would be kind of a stimulating, interesting, original take to ask 
an outsider, as it were, on German culture, German carols, German music, for their take on, as you say, these very familiar words. So it is a totally original piece of music. It's not an arrangement of anything else, again for double choir. And um, I think it's one of the more kind of playful works that Yakov has written for us. Some of his music is a little like Wolfram Buchenberg's in the, these grand chords, there's a huge structure. This piece doesn't work that way at all. It just shows you his flexibility. It's much more melodic. And again, there's this little dialogue between the two choirs. How many years ago was this written for the choir? That's a, a good question. I think maybe um, now five or six years ago. Yes, I think I remember why I didn't remember singing it. I had laryngitis for that concert and I couldn't <laughs> sing. <laughs> that would do it. Yes. <laughs> okay, here we have then, Es ist ein Rosensprungen by our dear friend Yakov Gubanov. We'll move on now to Susanina by Claire McLean, another one of our uh, former composers in residence, a piece that I've performed and recorded now a few, a few times. Uh, I, I have to admit, I still don't think I understand how it works. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the, I guess, the pleasures of, of uh, Claire's music is that it's um, highly intricate. And uh, in this particular piece, I'm struck every single time we come back to it, um, how, how 
tricky it is as a performer and how as a listener it seems to end up sounding inevitable as if this is you know how it just popped into being it came to be this way but uh, when you're in the midst of it and you're um, you're having to, to, to transcribe and figure out what all these symbols mean and, and why exactly is this one line slightly different than it was the last 36 times you sang it. Um, it can become really challenging, but it, it is a, a piece that, that and, and I've had this experience many times with the choir, that you know, when you're as committed to new music, especially commissions, as Philip and, and the chamber chorus is, it requires, uh, I think, a lot of humility on the part of the performers. It requires us to reserve judgment until all the, the pieces have actually been put in place. Uh, when we read through something and make a lot of mistakes, it can be easy to think this isn't very interesting or good, but those <laughs> mistakes are the thing preventing yeah, us yeah. From, from seeing it for what it is. And I've often found, and especially with this piece, that it, it comes out the other end um, much a, 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 a much more interesting and uh, uh, thought-provoking experience uh, than from where that initial place starts. There are multiple texts, sources of different texts in this piece. There are different meters, there are different musical ideas. And every time we perform it, and every time I hear it, I hear something new, mm -hmm. which I think is a mark of a, you know, an original mind at work. So Claire McLean was our composer in residence uh, before Yakov Gubanov, and she uh, writes music in such a different way from Yakov and from her predecessor, Sasha Johnson Manning. It's a way that has always intrigued me. Um, her, there's a type of art, I think some of you will be familiar with, visual art, called found art, mm -hmm. where you find things in, in your environment and you, you construct a new work from those different disparate elements. And if you're good, of course, it's a magnificent thing. And, and the rest of us look at it and go, how would it be anything other than that? But Claire takes these different strands, these different little bits of music in her head, and she weaves them together. So when you look at them individually, you go, oh, well, that's just those few notes there. What's the point? I don't see that that's terribly exciting. But when you put them all together, if the singers can do it, it's very difficult. You did yeah. not o uh, overstate that. It's very, very challenging, I think, to perform her music because you have to go out on a limb and say, well, to me at the moment, uh, on a Monday night rehearsal at 8.30 when I want a break, this doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. But I have to have faith that one day it will work. And that's exactly what happens with her music. And, and, and all her music, I think, is like that that you, you create this sort of, the analogy I would give is like of a musical bird's nest. With all these different twigs and strands coming together and holding together. And it's such an original way to look at words and sounds. And in this case, it's a lullaby. You just hear so many times the little word lullaby, which is, of course, in Susanina, Susanina. And the stress is in different places on the, in that word sometimes. The voices are giving you slightly different rhythms, cross rhythms, sort of knocking against one another. And as, as you know, Andy, it's so easy when you perform this piece to be knocked off your perch and to start singing in homophony, in unison with another part. Exactly. When that, it's wrong. You mustn't do that. So... Um, it's, it's, she's a remarkably challenging but re ultimately rewarding composer. She lives in Sydney, Australia, where she's a professor of music. Uh, but she grew up, she's the, almost exactly my age, and she grew up in Timaru in New Zealand. And she's only been to uh, the Northern Hemisphere, I think, once in her life. And I think I've made this joke before, but I'm, it's a good joke. So. <laughs> If you lived in the Southern Hemisphere and you could go to one place in the Northern Hemisphere, where would that place be? Paris, London, Rome, St. Louis, Louis Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> so she came and she's, so she's heard this choir perform her music. And subsequent to that, pieces that she has written for us 
always have that in her ear. She has the R sound in her ear. So when you listen to her music on our commercial discs, that's music that's been specifically created for this sort of sound of an instrument, a vocal instrument. Well, that's enough about all that. Let's, let's sit back and revel and be amazed at all the different themes and strands that come together in Claire McLean's Susanina.
We'll move on to Sasha Johnson Manning's uh, Christmas Bells, uh, a wonderful counterpart to the other pieces that we've heard today because once again utilizes the, the double choir uh, to great effect but is um, more of a, a reimagining of uh, found materials in the musical sense uh, in, in that way. Yeah. Uh, we're combining a couple of traditional familiar things into something that's layered and nuanced and new. So we've had double choir music where we've had the same text being sung by the two choirs or the two sides of the choir to one another. What makes this next piece so original, so extraordinary, is that what Sasha Manning has done is taken two completely different texts and set them for two separate choirs and each one could perform that piece on its own and you'd think, oh, that was a beautiful carol. But because they both concern bells at Christmas, she has found a way to combine them. So you get that sort of bifurcated existence as a listener where you're listening and you think, wait a minute, my right ear can hear ding dong merrily on high, but my other ear, my left ear can hear I heard the bells on Christmas day. And so it's, it's an extraordinary effect. It's the sort of thing that makes me certain that I'm not a composer because I can't begin to get my head around this. Um, you know, I think everybody dreams of writing a little song here and again, here and now, but, but this sort of thing just shows you what a true composer can do. The, the, what the power of the creativity behind this piece is, is breathtaking. So you hear um, a rather tragic poem in some ways, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, by an American poet, Longfellow, and then you hear the English words, Ding Dong Merrily on High. And so it's a perfect piece for us because here we are, an American choir in the American Midwest, but founded by a Briton. I, of course, am from Britain originally. Sasha Manning is, is from Britain. And so you've got this sort of marriage of America and England together in this very beautiful piece, very evocative, very clever piece, and very joyful piece, Christmas Bells by Sasha Johnson Manning.
<laughs> you know, you may be of a certain generation to appreciate this, and if you're not, you'll just have to excuse me for a minute, but every time I hear the end of that piece and I hear the different voices going, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, I think of we, what we really need is the light and sound crew from the Lawrence Welk show to just be sort of spotlighting. It would be incredibly off-putting as a singer, <laughs> but it really is made for the sort of 60s television match in some ways. I think. Yeah. So, terrific. Well, we move on to uh, Eric Eschenwald's uh, In the Bleak Midwinter. Uh, if you've heard this piece before, um, you'll be looking forward to hearing it again. It's one of those um, fairly rare uh, circumstances which, you know, the, the, the music arrives in an email or in a mail and it's printed out and handed to the choir and we sing it and everyone pretty much simultaneously knows that we've just brought to life something that will be sung for many, many years by many, many people. And Eric's music is much that way. He, he at least as for the time being, sort of has a niche. He writes within that and delivers hits each time, each Every time, time, right? So helps, helps with the mortgage. I yeah, think. it probably does. And so this In the Bleak Midwinter, another such a familiar beloved text, the Christina Rossetti, but a new, a new melody that, that our recording of this, you know, in some ways it's so good and the engineering is so good on this that it's really hard to get the full effect because in this piece, what I think was most challenging for the choir to master was that we have phrases handed back and forth, full SATB fr uh, phrases. And it's not, you know, one choir sings a whole stanza and then the next choir. It's within maybe one phrase you're trading back completely. And to make that sound seamless and, and even is very challenging, um, even if the notes themselves are not. It's true that if you listen to the sound recording, we spent so much time on it, getting it seamless, that in a sense we've lost a little of the magic. And that's why live performance is so yeah. valuable, because you can be there and actually watch, as it were, the melody going from side to side, like one of these vocal tennis matches. You yeah. know? And it's not quite as easy to pick that out on a recording. So you'll just have to take our word for yeah. it, that it's really happening. Um, yeah, this is an extraordinary piece of music, really, because what Eric Sessionvalz does, and, and I think Bob Chilcott as well, we're going to finish with Bob Chilcott today, um, what they do is they, they create, they, they conjure an idea, and then they, they work on that idea. They, they tease it out to its natural conclusion. And some other composers... Sometimes when people give me a piece of music to look at, they say, what would you look at this? And I say, well, you know, the trouble is that you've got enough ideas in this piece for a symphony, but we've only got four minutes. And what you need to do is to stop taking section by section by section with a new idea each time. What you need to do is to, 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 to find the overall musical thematic material and then unpack it, see if it can be echoed or elaborated on, but always recognizably coming from that original idea. And as I say, I'm no composer, but I have a, been doing this long enough now that I have a good feeling for what works and what doesn't work. And let me tell you, everybody, this works. Um, this, is, this is like an object lesson in how to do this. What's great about this piece is that not only is it written for us by a composer at the very top of his game, but again, yet again, we have this great sort of complement, complement, I suppose, between either side of the Atlantic Ocean. So we, we have an American choir with a Latvian composer in Europe setting very familiar words by Christina Rossetti, an English poet. But these words, if you didn't know, these words were actually written specifically for an American magazine, Scribner's Monthly. So just as the words sort of testify to that sort of transatlantic relationship, so does the music as well. So, Eric's Eschenwaltz in the bleak midwinter.
Eric's Eschenwalds in the bleak midwinter. Well, now another piece for double choir using different texts by a British composer whom we've been very fortunate to commission on several occasions, uh, Judith Bingham. But this is not a commission. This was a piece that Judith wrote some years earlier for, I think, the Litchfield Festival. And um, I always wanted to give a sort of, a, I suppose, a definitive performance of this. It's a very difficult work, but it's a really great work because what Judith is able to do is to sort of conjure a feeling, an atmosphere, in a very few phrases. She's a, a very dramatic composer. And what she's managed to capture is not just the, the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of the birth at Christmas, but also the, the perilous circumstances surrounding it. And I don't just mean not being able to get a room at the Hyatt. I mean, this is, this, the, the, the power behind this setting is the fact that we should always remember those chilling words of Herod, who told the wise men, tell me where the child is born so that I can go and, and adore him as well. And spoiler alert, as you know, he had no intention of doing that. He wanted to kill all the, the young babies because he believed that one of them would one day usurp him and become greater than him. So that is, that's the backdrop to the, the Christmas story. It's not all tinsel and, and Frosty the Snowman. It's, it's a, there's a lot of menace uh, in the background to the Christmas story. What Judith Bingham is able to do is to tap into that menace while still giving you the mystery of the birth of God in the form of a baby. Um, so I think it's really a remarkable work. And uh, we, I think she sort of slightly changed or corrected a couple of things from her original vision of it. So in some ways, this was a premiere. I think it certainly was an American premiere, but it might have been in some ways a world premiere of, of, of this sort of slightly reworked version. However we want to define it, I think it's a wonderful piece, a very important piece to hear amidst all the beautiful, restful music that we've enjoyed this afternoon. This is a piece that I think makes you think. Certainly. I mean, those that have been to uh, chamber chorus Christmas concerts, really they should just be called Concert 3, right? Because they're, they're not all full of Ding Dong Merrily on High, right? And, 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 and truly, um, one of the great things about art, our art in choral music is, you know, in, in a much more contemporary way, many composers are, are, are finding ways to, to create engaging pieces that explore subject matter that isn't simply relaxation, happiness, peacefulness. So we won't leave you on this note, but we will explore a bit of the, the dangerous side of this story and the, and the menace, as you said, that was present at the time. So this is Judith Bingham's O Manu Mysterium.
truly evocative music. And, you know, I, as we sat there listening to it, I was thinking about your words of the, the menace, the underlying menace. I can tell you, and I see a few of our um, colleagues from the choir, singing music like that makes you feel as if you are under threat because it is so difficult, <laughs> because yeah. it is so unpredictable. All of these um, sort of strange and unexpected sounds, they're unexpected for us as well, and they're, they're such a challenge. It's so difficult to perform that kind of music a cappella with the kind of assurance that you need in order to, to convey it effectively. Yeah, I mean, no, no cues from the organ or the piano. <laughs> it, it, the buck is truly stopping with you on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really testimony to the extraordinary dedication that all the singers have given over many years to put together these pieces. It's one of the reasons, I would suggest, why composers around the world uh, at least, you know, return my calls most of the time. I mean, uh, you know, they know that they may not get particularly rich off a commission from the chamber chorus, but they will get a, a, a devoted, a dedicated effort to realizing their vision as well as we can do it. And that, I think, you know, as, as I say, I'm not a composer, but I've heard from so many of them that, that that's one of the things they truly appreciate. The idea that, that the very lonely world that um, a composer, any artist really, the very lonely world that they occupy, somebody has sort of reached in and shared that vision with them and brought it out and helped the rest of us appreciate what, what it was they conjured up in their heads. Absolutely. So the, the, the last piece we're going to hear today is by another person who started off life as a singer, as a very young lad. He was a choir boy in the choir of King's College, Cambridge, and uh, he might be proud or horrified for me to remind you that if you want to hear him sing the soprano solos in the Foray Requiem, it is still in the catalog, it is still available all these decades later. So he was a wonderful boy soprano, his voice then broke, and then later on he came back to King's College Cambridge as a tenor, choral scholar, and then some years after that he was with some of his fellow ex-choral scholars in a group called the Light Blues, and then subsequent to that he got recruited for a very famous choral group that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of called the King Singers. And all the way through those different ensembles, Bob Chilcott was, was writing and arranging music. And really, um, I think, applying what he knew, what he was learning as a practitioner, as a singer, to the way he wrote music. So to me, he's a sort of English version of Eric Eschenwaltz, in that there's a sort of just an immediate accessibility about his music. But what we mustn't do is equate accessibility with dumbing down or it being simplified. It's not that at all. It's just here's somebody who has a very clear musical idea. They know how they want to express it. They know how you and you and you are going to react in a rehearsal to working on. And, and it's a delight to perform music by people like this because you don't struggle to try and explain to the singers. I didn't have to, when we rehearsed this piece, I didn't need to stop and explain to the chorus what this was all about. It's, it's obvious on the page. So what we have here is two, um, again, two different poems. This is another double choir piece. Two different poems that speak to one another. And the first one is, again, an American poet, very important for an American choir. This is Emily Dickinson. And Emily Dickinson is beloved of composers, let me just tell you. There are so many settings of poetry by Emily Dickinson. She seems to have a way with words that sort of invites composers to put their, little, their, their spin on it, if you will. Years ago, we, we had some seasons where we addressed musical settings of individual poets. And I well remember coming up with the brilliant idea totally brilliant idea of a whole program of settings of Robert Browning. That turned out not to be such a great idea because it turns out that Robert Browning, if you've ever read any of Robert Browning's uh, verse, it is dense. It's amazingly dense and, the, and he took an enormous pleasure 
in the sound of the words. And so actually not that many composers have had the guts to take on Robert Browning and put him to music. So, so I think if I remember rightly, I had to change it and make it Browning and Goethe or something like that. <laughs> but it was, it, it, was, it was a lesson learned, you know, whereas Emily Dickinson always just allows that much space in for a composer to creep in and say, well, here's, here's the music behind those words. So the first poem is Before the Ice, which gives us the title of the piece. And then the second poem is, of course, that wo those words which we've heard now already, O Manium Mysterium, O Great Mystery. So the two combine, sort of speak to one another in this just incredibly elegant and beautiful way. So let's enjoy now as our finale, Bob Chilcott's Before the Ice.
as we listen to the to that glorious ending, the Alleluia, it struck a memory in me that I don't feel like it was there in the first copy. It was like added on. It's a stroke of genius, I think, on Bob Jilcott's well, part. It, it was uh, there was a, something there, but we we asked him after that wonderful exploding of the idea, can you just extend That's right. that alleluia? So he went back to the drawing board and did that, and I think it was a good decision. Yeah, absolutely. A lovely piece. What, that last one uh, is probably one, one of the three times I can remember coming home late on a Monday night, the first time we rehearsed something and telling my wife, you're really going to like this. You're really, <laughs> really going to like this, I promise you. Um, we'll conclude today uh, with uh, a question. Uh, I was asked to, to um, bring a question to Philip that he hadn't considered uh, for the program. And although we're looking at uh, and listening to um, music of this sort of Christmas uh, season and Christmas time, uh, with the focus on um, new pieces and with commissions, I, I, I wanted to ask if there were any from this list or others, I suppose, but any from this list that, that uh, you know, you receive the music, you review it, you're preparing for, for rehearsal, any that, that you can remember um, truly shocking you, surprising you, either in how, how well it went or how poorly it went or, or hearing things in the choir, even in initial um, stages of rehearsing that, that opened your uh, imagination and hel helped you to see or hear it differently? I, I have not had time to prepare an answer for that. Um, that's a good question. I think, I think there are two responses. The first is, there are some of these pieces we've listened to, and I think we've alluded to this as well in the discussion. Some of these pieces started off to me being very dense and rather difficult to sort of see where the vision was, but then the, the, the mists cleared, you know, and as we worked on it week by week by week, everything started to fall into place. I think that was definitely the case with Judith's piece, and that's often the case with her music, <laughs> for me anyway. And always worth the journey, but it is a journey, nonetheless. I think also, um, oddly enough, a piece you said you liked and, and we, you haven't sung, the Moody, it was very, um, it's, a, it's a long piece of music. And we're so conditioned, aren't we, to thinking of, of pieces of music being between three and a half and four and a half minutes long. You know, the original, the, again, those of you can remember EPs, the little discs that could only play a certain amount of time if we had to turn the record over. So we're so conditioned to that, that to receive a piece of music that clearly is a modern piece. I mean, I can understand Beethoven not, not obeying those rules, but, but to get a modern piece that just didn't have any sense of that whatsoever. In other words, I think Ivan Moody wrote a piece from a very spiritual place that just said, this is going to take as long as it's going to take, you know? Yeah. And I remember in, in the days when I would sing in, it was singing in cathedral choirs, some, particularly when it was just the men of the choir, not the men and the boys or the men and the girls, we would sing plain song. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a monk and I've never been one, nor have I played one on television. Actually, that's a lie. I have played one on television a very long time ago. But um, um, there is something extraordinary about plain chant or plain song that's hypnotic. And I, I do remember being like 11 or 12 minutes into chanting and realizing that you were having like an out-of-body experience and yet the music was carrying on. Now the, the O Viridissima Virgo is not that long but I think it was a real challenge to sort of just switch off that part of the brain and just let the piece go on its own. Um, so I think that was a, an unusual challenge. The one that surprises me still to this day and um, if he watches this presentation I'm I'm sure he'll be extremely amused. This Charles Collins' piece. There's just something about that piece that, I, you know, I don't speak Finnish. I don't understand it at all. Um, it's not as if it's just a, a really catchy, upbeat melody that sticks in your ear, but there is something about that piece, particularly the, the end of it, where there's a little repetition of da, 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 da. And somebody else goes, da, 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 da. 
that I, I, I can never get it out of my head. And in fact, this has been something of a masochistic exercise for me this afternoon, because now I will have that back in my head for quite a long time before the next earworm comes along. There's worse things to, to have in your mind, so we'll, we'll and, be okay with it. Exactly. And Charles, if you're watching, you're not getting any more money. <laughs> Didn't get any money to begin with, so... But, uh, but thank you for that gift of your music. It's, it's truly wonderful. And I'm glad to say that is one of the pieces that is published. So presumably other choirs have had the opportunity to, to be obsessed with that piece the way I have been. Well, as we conclude, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about and listen to music at the conclusion of what has been a very difficult year for all of us. Uh, it is refreshing to stop for a moment and reflect on something that we all love, that we all share, and we haven't been doing. And uh, to, to say a, a prayer or a thought for, for days in the future where we'll be back doing this uh, live and, and uh, together. Uh, but in the meantime, it's nice to be here today and talk with you and, and to share with all of you. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here. I think all of us know that expression, 2020 vision, and I think this year, We've been given a vision of where we go from here and what we can do with um, our choral music when circumstances return to normal and we're able to meet together and make music together. Yeah. But for now, thank you, Andy. Thank you, all of you. And here's to our next presentation, which will be in February. Thank you. Thank you.